Hi there, welcome to Father's House Online. Uh, you might notice that we're back in the church this week uh, and we're going to do the beginning of the message from the church. I have also noticed I've got my coat on. This isn't for here, this is for when I go home because it's colder there than it is here where I'm going to do the rest of the filming. Only joking. But the reason why I'm down the church is because we're about to enter into the season of Lent. Next week is Ash Wednesday in the beginning of Lent. And Lent is about two things. It's to remember the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. And the 40 days of Lent are to remember his 40 days of going into the desert. Strange thing there is, his 40 days in the desert and his sacrifice on the cross are not in the same time frame. They're like three years apart. Uh, so don't ask me how all that fits in. I don't know. But the point I want to make is, the 40 days in, in the desert that we celebrate, that was right at the beginning of the ministry of Jesus, at the very beginning, before he began his ministry, after his baptism, he went into the desert to prepare himself for the ministry. And we've been teaching uh, at the beginning of this series on the Sermon on the Mount, that the Sermon on the Mount, starting with the Beatitudes, is to prepare Jesus' disciples, including us, his followers, for ministry. It's the basic starting point. It's what we need to learn and take on board, the standards and values that every follower of Jesus should have. So Lent is a great reminder that's expected of us, the standards that we are to live by and visibly live by as followers of Jesus Christ, as, as his disciples. And it's really important because the more we go into the Sermon on the Mount, you will see this week it gets tougher and tougher. The standards of being a follower of Jesus get higher and higher and higher. Now that might seem like bad news, but you're just going to have to trust me, it's, it's good news, as you'll see in the rest of this message. And we start this week with looking at what Jesus said about being salt. But before we look at what Jesus said about being salt and light, it's worthwhile having a quick recap of our Sermon on the Mount series. And we started with looking at the Beatitudes. And the first Beatitude that we looked at is, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for they will see God. And I said at the time that I believe that that is the starting point for our relationship with God. For anybody that wants to follow Jesus, that's the beginning point. Coming to him in humility and brokenness and saying, God, I can't do it. I can't do it without you. I need your help uh, to, live the, to live the life, to get back into relationship with you. Uh, and even just to sort my own life out, I can't do it without your help. And that's a start. And then we move on to the second beatitude, where is blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. And I suggested a few weeks ago that uh, as much as that is about mourning and those who mourn and grieve that have lost people they love, that it actually means more than that, that it's mourning about the loss of our relationship with Jesus and grieving over it. So if you look at the Bible and throughout history, many people have wonderful a wonderful relationship with God, but they lose it. The people of God, the Israelites did it. Many people throughout church history have done it. Peter, the disciple, had a great relationship and then denied Jesus and grieved over what he had done. So what I was suggesting was that from time to time, we will grieve over how far we've drifted from God and lost that relationship. And in, in that, when we recognise that and admit to that and repent, then we are blessed and God will comfort us. And all begins, all is made well again, because that's how great God is. Then after that, the, the rest of the Beatitudes, certainly the next four of the eight Beatitudes, talk about our character and what, how our character can be more Christ-like, as in being merciful and peacemaker and, uh, and different things. Uh, and then the last two talk about persecution and being, and being aware that blessed are those who are persecuted. Jesus is saying, look, if you're gonna follow me, chances are you're gonna suffer. Not saying you absolutely will, but chances are, if you're serious about following me, you're gonna suffer for it. He did, his followers did, people throughout church history have done and many Christians around the world today are suffering and dying for the name of Jesus in the persecuted church around the world. So 
the chances are that we'll get away scot-free are slim. If you do, good on you. But I, it, Jesus was trying to warn, warn us and I'm just trying to warn you the same. And that warning is also good preparation for where Jesus then continues his sermon after the beginning of the Beatitudes. And this is where we come to his teaching on being salt and light and also his teaching about the law of which I'll come back to later. But let's start with salt and light, what Jesus said and what does that mean? Now, just before I, I read those verses out, uh, just I, I wanna add in that what I'm gonna talk about this week and where I finished off last week about the warning about persecution and be ready for that and that it's okay to suffer in a way, not to dwell in suffering or to enjoy it. Uh, I would question why you want to do that, but don't be discouraged when it happens. None of that seems like good news. Can Jesus not just tell us all the nice bits, not have to tell us about the horrible bits? Well, he has to, because if he doesn't, then we're not prepared. So in warning us and telling us about these things, what Jesus is doing is, is uh, raising our expectation and getting us prepared for when tough times come and you may have heard that saying if you uh, if you've failed to prepare then prepare to fail so if we're if we're only ever told that being a christian is all rosy in the garden and nothing ever goes wrong when things go wrong many people fall away and i've seen it over the years they walk away from god or if they don't walk away they live a second rate or third rate life uh, with hardly any joy or, power, or evidence of the power of God because they've become so disappointed and discouraged that things have gone wrong and they never believed they should have done. That's because you've been taught a lie. Jesus didn't say that. Jesus warned us so that we could get ready and dig into him so that he would be our foundation. And so all Jesus is doing is trying to help us get ready. It's actually good news in a strange way that Jesus is preparing us. But anyway, let's move on to the teaching on salt and light, beginning at Matthew 5, verses 13 to 16. I'll just read it to you now. It says, you are the salt of the earth, but if the salt loses its saltiness, how can it be made salty again? It is no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled by men. Verse 14, you are the light of the world. A city on a hill cannot be hidden. Neither do people light a lamp and put it under a bowl. Instead, they put it on a stand and it gives light to everyone in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before men that they may see your good deeds and praise your Father in heaven. So first thing we're going to look at is what does he mean when he's talking about salt uh, and that we have to be salt and be aware of losing our saltiness. So we'll deal with that first and then we'll come back to looking what it means to be uh, light and live in the light and shine our light. But let's start with salt. And the first thing with that is that we need to know there are different types of salt. Uh, and they range from the common white salt, like a ground salt, the very fine stuff that most of us have in our homes that we'll put on our food right through to rock salt. Uh, if you don't know what rock salt is, that's what the gritting wagons uh, are currently chucking out on our roads in the midst of winter with the snow and ice. And the rock salt helps to melt the ice. It, it's quite big and gritty and usually a brown in colour. You wouldn't want to be putting it on your dinner. Uh, so salt comes in various forms, shapes and sizes. And there's various, in between your common garden household salt and rock salt, there's a number of different types of salt. I'm not going to explain them all, but I'll put some of them up as pictures so you can see, like coarse sea salt and things like that. But bottom line is, whilst there's different types of salt and even look different, they all serve the same purpose. And the purpose of salt is to do one of two things, or maybe even two at the same time. One is to season or flavour food. That's why many chefs add salt to food, if ever you watch cooking programs, uh, and we like watching them, especially if it's set in Italy, you know, they say a pinch of salt, it's more like half a cup or a bucket. You know, they put loads of salt in to add flavour. And, and they say that it's to add flavour uh, to season. But the other purpose of salt is to preserve. And in ancient times, but even now you see it, 
before refrigeration, it was used to preserve meat, to stop it going off. So salt is to uh, to season or flavour or to preserve, uh, or another word for preserve is to protect. You could even argue with rock salt that it's doing the job of protection, uh, protecting people from crashing on ice. So you've got different types of salt, but they save the, serve the same purpose, either to, to flavour, to season or flavour, or to preserve. However, once salt, and it doesn't matter what kind of salt it is, household salt or rock salt, once salt fails to do either of those things, as in serve its purpose, then it is no longer fit for purpose. It's just waste, it's rubbish. And this is what Jesus is trying to teach his disciples, his followers, then and even now with us. So what he's saying is basically this. In a tasteless world that has lost its direction because it has basically rejected God and his goodness, followers of Jesus should not just look different, we should taste different. Psalm 34, 8, taste and see that the Lord is good. People should be able to taste and see that the Lord is good when they meet us. Because we represent Jesus. If we're his disciples, we should represent Jesus. We Also, we should add flavour to our society. We should make it better. It's not just about look, looking different. We should add something to our society. We should add flavour to society and to our community, our local community, because of who we are. And as I said before, more importantly, who we represent. We are the ambassadors of Jesus Christ. As an ambassador represents a country in a foreign land, you know, we're people of the citizens of the kingdom of heaven. We represent the kingdom of heaven and the king of heaven, Jesus, here on earth. It's not enough to look the part. We have to be the part. So we should add something. We should literally taste different and be different from everybody else. Not in a weird old way, but in a good way. But as I said earlier, another of the purposes of salt is to preserve or protect and we should also preserve and protect the society that we are in. Not just because we're different, but because we love. We should love people just as much God loves people and loves us. For God so loved the world that he sent his one and only son, Jesus, to, to die in our place. That whoever believes in him should not perish and have eternal life. We should love the world as much as Jesus loves the world in that we want to see people saved, preserved, protect them from the coming judgment. And to do that, then what we have to do is we've got to be prepared to stand in the gap or intercede for the people around us, for this lost and broken world around us, and intercede for God to save them and pray for God to save them, but also follow that up with our action in trying to protect people by bringing it, being champions of justice, uh, uh, and equality and freedom uh, just as God is and just just as Moses and all the prophets and the disciples did and ultimately Jesus did and still does Jesus stood up for the downtrodden the broken the sick he stood up for justice and what it was what was right that's righteousness and blessed you know blessed are those who are persecuted because of righteousness we should be about righteousness. We should be making a difference in the society. We should flavour it and we should preserve it and protect it. And if we fail to do that, not only are we being disobedient to the word of God, uh, it's actually much worse than that. We actually become distasteful. Distasteful. In Revelation, Jesus talks about a church. He says, you're neither hot nor cold, you're lukewarm. And I spew you out of my mouth because you're distasteful. He's talking about a church here. Not non-believers, but believers. And if we fail to be salt and light, we're not only being disobedient, we're being distasteful. And you could argue we're actually useless and fit for nothing. How do I know that? Well, I'm going to read to you Luke chapter 14, verses 34 to 35, because this is Luke retelling the same story about being salt and light. Well, in particular, the salt bit. But 
but Luke goes into a little bit more detail. Just let me read this to you. And uh, I apologize if you're going to be offended, but I am reading from the Luke Bible. Luke puts it this way when he's quoting Jesus. He says, salt is good, but if it loses its saltiness, how can it be made salty again? It's impossible. You can't re-salt salt. But verse 35, he says, it is fit neither for the soil. You couldn't throw it on the soil because it would actually ruin the, the potential of any crop growing. But Luke takes it even further. He says, it's neither fit neither for the soil nor for the manure pile. It is thrown out. Uh, I don't, don't know how I can put this nicely, but Luke, in quoting Jesus, saying, if salt loses its saltiness, it's not even fit to be thrown on a pile of poo. <laughs> it's, we can laugh, but that's a serious statement. That if, if we're not about being salt to society then we're not even fit to be on a pile of poo that's a strong statement from jesus i want to say one more thing about salt before we move on to light uh, and it is this a single grain of salt can neither season nor preserve anything try it you know try picking out one little grain of salt on its own and putting that on your dinner and see how much of a difference that makes to adding flavour. You're not going to get very far because it's not going to work. Next time the roads ice over, you know, have a word with the local council. And when the gritter wagon comes, say, don't spread it all over the roads. I'll take care of it. I'm going to put one grain on there and it'll make all the difference. I know it sounds like I'm being silly, but I'm trying to make a point. Because as Christians, we often think I don't need the church. I can do this on my own. I don't need to meet with the church. It's me and God, God and me. No, it isn't. No, it isn't. You are part of something much bigger. And one person can make a difference. I'm not disputing that. But that's not how it's meant to be. We're meant to be part of a body all together, the body of Christ. Read the scriptures on it. You're not meant to be separate or cut yourself off because you don't like it or it's not comfortable for you. Basically, Jesus is saying you can only do this when you're together. So when Jesus is talking about salt, he's not talking about you as an individual, as a single grain. He's talking about the church and that together we've got to be salt in order to make a difference. Now, there's so much more I could say about this as in salt and what it means to be salt. And as part of this, I was going to use an illustration from uh somebody else's message uh, a pastor preacher called francis chan talks about it and i love how he describes it but when i re-watched it and a message i've watched lots of times i thought no i'm not gonna use a bit of his message and tag it sorry into my message what i'm gonna do is instead is i'm gonna put the link up on this video and attach it to the description on youtube and I encourage you to watch the whole message on your own because he doesn't just talk about salt. He talks about discipleship and uh, and really asks the question, is the church of today, the Western church, being as effective as it really could be? And he asks some hard questions and I would urge you to watch it and maybe come back to me and let me know what you think. Uh, I love it. You might not, but I'd still be interested in what you think. So I'll leave that there and now let's move on to light. Because Jesus says we are to be light and not to hide that light. You know, not just be salt, we're called to be light. And th that's clear uh, and many of us probably think we know what that means and with good reason. Uh, and let me give you some examples. Light from a lighthouse, and we often see the church as a lighthouse. Light from a lighthouse saves lives and it does so by warning ships that are coming nearby that they are in dangerous waters full of rocks that could cause that ship to sink that could cause a shipwreck and a loss of life so a lighthouse is warning people of the dangers around so light is a warning against danger also light from a lamp or a torch guides our path psalm 119 105 your word is a lamp for my feet and a light for my path. And that's because the purpose of light is to dispel the darkness. 
And in dispelling the darkness, what light does, it makes things visible that weren't visible before, visible before, and it helps us to see better. You can see far better in the light than in the darkness. And I know if you walk around the darkness, you know, if your, your eyes can adjust, but it will never be as good as it is in bright daylight when the light is fully available. And that's why we need the light. It's why the world needs the light. And the light that we are called to shine and not to hide, not to hide under a bowl, as it says here, or hide under a building or inside a building, a church building, that light is Jesus. He is the light within us. He's also the light of the world. John eight twelve says, Jesus says, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will never walk in darkness because lightness dispels darkness, but will have the light of life, as in literally have that light of life living in them. So if you've chosen to follow Jesus, you have that light, the light of the world, the light of life living in you, ready to shine out of you. Ephesians 5, 8, let me read that to you in case you wanted further proof. It says, for you were once darkness or in darkness, but now you are light or in the light. You are light in the Lord. So live as children of light. Don't hide your light. Don't live in the darkness. Don't shut it away. Live as children of light. Take that light out. Therefore, what Jesus is saying to us, that we must not hide the light, which is Jesus, that is within us inside our church buildings, or even, dare I say, inside our own homes. And, you know, I've had a number of conversations, even today with some really good friends, uh, Christian friends, about reaching people. And how do we reach people? You know, if we really believe we've got the message of good news that can change people's lives and change the world, a message of hope that the world desperately needs, why are we struggling so much to get that message across and to reach people. If we can be honest, we're not very successful at it. Uh, by, I, I would say in, in the Western church, some churches are more successful than others, but by and large, we're not. The church is actually uh, diminishing in the West. It's not growing uh, like it is in uh, churches in persecuted countries, where it's not just growing, it's growing massively and the church is thriving, even in the midst of persecution. And one of the reasons I believe is that is we've actually stopped shining our light. We only ever show our light in a church building or in meetings in our homes. But where that light needs to be is not hidden out where it can be seen. So we need to take our light out of the church building, out of our homes and into the darkness. Because in the darkness is where Jesus has called us to be. What's the darkness? Where is the darkness? Well, the darkness is wherever there are people not living in light, people that don't yet know Jesus. So th that's all around us. So we need to get out. That's what Jesus called us to do. Matthew 28, 18 to 20. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, teaching them everything I have commanded you. You know the story. I've said it many times. But, but the emphasis there, Jesus says, therefore, go. He says, it didn't say invite in. He said, go. We need to go out into the darkness with the light rather than trying to bring the darkness into the church in the hope that one day we'll have an influence. It's not enough. And the evidence is in that we're not seeing the transformation of the world and the growth of the kingdom anywhere near like we should. And we'll only ever change that by taking our light out. If you want some help with that, want to chat that through then please give me a shout and i'd love to help you because i'm on that journey myself now we're going to move on from talking about salt and light or from what jesus said about that to what jesus said about the law and fulfilling the law and it's important we do because i've talked to uh, many christians over the years and heard them say that uh, the law is finished we're not under the law we're under grace romans six fourteen is it uh and I, I get what they're saying. We're now in a new covenant. It's not the old covenant. But before you fully accept that, and we are under grace, you need to listen to what Jesus is actually saying here. So let me read it to you. Matthew five seventeen to 20. 
Jesus says, do not think that I have come to abolish the law or the prophets, the prophets that preceded him. I have not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. I tell you the truth, until heaven and earth disappear, not the smallest letter nor the least stroke of a pen, or the Hebrew, they call it the jot, the part of a letter, will by any means disappear from the law until everything is accomplished. And anyone who breaks one of the least of these commandments in the law and teaches others to do the same will be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever practices and teaches, not just teaches, practices and teaches these commands will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. For I tell you, <laughs> listen to this, for I tell you, unless your righteousness, remember he's talking to his followers, his disciples, unless your righteousness surpasses that of the Pharisees and the teachers of the law, you will certainly not enter the kingdom of heaven. Now, that seems like bad news. <laughs> you know, Jesus saying, unless your righteousness is basically to my standard, past the Pharisees, the teachers of the laws, you're not even going to get into the kingdom of heaven. Uh, that almost seems like we've got no hope, but that is not true. Let me explain. Because in that statement, Jesus said he came not to abolish the law, but to fulfill it. And Jesus did fulfill the law. He is the only person in all of history that did it, that did not sin and obeyed all the commandments. But even though Jesus has fulfilled the law, that does not mean that the law has disappeared, even though you may have heard that and we'd like to think it. It does not mean the law has disappeared because Jesus says it won't disappear unless heaven and earth disappear. And the last time I looked, heaven and earth are still here. Well, certainly earth is because I'm living on it. Uh, so the law can't have disappeared according to what Jesus says. So what does he mean? I believe what Jesus is talking about here uh, is what he's calling us, his followers, to do. And it's to, for us to uh, not to go back to living by the letter of the law, which is what the Pharisees and the, teach, the religious teachers were trying to get people to do, and they couldn't do it. It was impossible. You know, it was all about uh, face and external image and, and looking good. And that's not what he's saying. You know, if you want to go back to living by the letter of the law, then, you know, let's form an orderly queue as long as I'm at the back of it in wanting to be circumcised because that's what the law says so it's not about living it by the letter of the law but what jesus is saying it's a call for us for his followers to live by god's standards and not the world's standards the law was put there to set the people of god apart there were standards they couldn't just live how they wanted there were standards the fact that nobody could attain them is in a way irrelevant. You've got to have some guidelines. That's why there are laws in every country, otherwise there's chaos. There has to be expected standards of what's right and what's wrong. And in fact, Jesus, in this message of the Sermon on the Mount, he just doesn't, he doesn't just talk about the law, but he takes the law, which was a standard of righteous behaviour that no one apart from him could truly live by, and then he makes it even more difficult. He ups the ante. He does like the law plus one <laughs> and makes it even more difficult to follow uh, and to follow the rules and behave, behave by them. So if no one apart from Jesus could meet the old standards of the law, so the existing law, then what hope, <laughs> what hope have we got of meeting the new standards that he's talking about, the even more difficult standards. The law was bad enough. Jesus calls to live to a higher standard of the law, as you will see as we move on from this. So what hope have we got of meeting these new and even more difficult standards that Jesus requires if we couldn't even meet the old ones? Now, that's a good question. Let me try and answer it. And my answer is this. The truth is, we can't. We can't meet that standard. We could meet the old standard. We're not going to meet the new one because the standard is impossible. And the more you try, the more you fail. In fact, this may sound pessimistic, but we're doomed to fail. Romans 3.23, for all have sinned, all, 
everyone that ever lived apart from Jesus and fall short of the glory of God. Even our best efforts will never be good enough. Jesus says your best efforts, your righteousness, so your best efforts, you keep trying, do as much as you want, is like filthy rags. That's like menstrual cloth to me. This doesn't sound like good news, but hang on in there. <laughs> because the point Jesus is trying to make here, it's not that we do away with the law because you need values and standards in society for it to function and especially to protect the weak and the vulnerable. And so that there is justice. They've got to be there. And if nobody chooses to live by them, it's chaos. So we need it. And followers of Jesus, you know, we should live to a better standard than anybody else. But we'll never live to the standard that God requires or the standard that will get us into the kingdom of heaven in our own strength. We can't do it. And that's the point Jesus is trying to make. What he's trying to teach us here is this is why you need a saviour. This is why I came to save the world because you can't save yourself. No matter how good you are, how man, good mankind thinks it is, even with all its technological advances, you will never be good enough to save yourself. The fact is we need a saviour. We need Jesus. He is our only hope. John 14, 6, Jesus says, I am the way, I am the truth, I am the life, I give you life. And no one, no one comes to the Father, into the kingdom of heaven, except through me. Because it is only by him, Jesus, and through him that we can be saved. And this is where we come back to the beginning of the, of the Sermon on the Mount. The Beatitudes, blessed are the poor in spirit, those who are humble and who cry out to God saying, God, I can't do this. I can't do it. I can't meet that standard. I keep failing. Help me. And what does God do? Say, yeah, I've just been waiting on that prayer. I've always known you couldn't do it. That's why I want to help you. And now that you're crying out and admitting you can't do it, that now we can start. Now that you're asking for help, we can start. And that's good news. Uh, and let me back that up with a few scriptures that I'll read to you now. First one being Psalm 80, verse 19. And this is a cry from the psalmist that says, Restore us, O Lord God Almighty. Make your face shine upon us that we may be saved. It's that recognition, without you, we can't be saved. We'll never be good enough. Here's a couple more. Psalm 107, verse 30. It says, then they cried to the Lord in their trouble and he saved them from their distress. One more. Psalm 116. I like six. this verse because I think it was written with me in mind. It says, the Lord protects the simple hearted. When I was in great need, he saved me. In other words, you and I cannot save ourselves. Doesn't matter how much we try and obey the law, we cannot save ourselves. It's right to try and obey it and live to a high standard as long as we realise that that won't save us. It's a good thing to do for us and for all of society around us to have justice and order, but it won't save us. Only Jesus can save you and me. So that shows us clearly and I could have given you many, many more verses that we need Jesus. We need a saviour and we have to cry out. We can't do it on our own. And this is the good news. When we cry out, what does God do? What is it God at his response? What does Jesus do? Hebrews 4, uh, 4 verses 14 to 16 says this. Let me read them to you. Therefore, since we have a great high priest, this is Jesus, who has gone through heaven, through the heavens, Jesus, the son of God, let us hold firmly, even in tough times and persecution and suffering and the COVID crisis, let us hold firmly to the faith we profess. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathise with our weaknesses, thank God. But we have, we have one who has been tempted in every way, just as we are, and yet was without sin. So let us then approach the throne of grace, not the throne of judgment, the throne of grace with confidence, so that we may receive 
mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. How great is that, that we receive mercy for all our sins and failures time and time again as long as we keep coming back in repentance. Uh, whenever we come back before Jesus in repentance and faith, we will be forgiven and receive mercy. That's just, it's amazing. That is good news. But it's even better than that. It's not just good news, it's great news. Because our hope doesn't just end there, there's even more. Because it says we also receive grace. And we receive grace in the form of being filled with God's Holy Spirit. Acts 1.8, Jesus says to his disciples, remain in Jer Jerusalem until you receive power from on high to be, be my witnesses. That's not just to tell people about Jesus, but for people to see that we're different, visibly different in how we live and how we love each other. Not just say how we love God, but how we love each other. That's what the early church did and people flocked to join it. And they're able to do that, not just because they were a bunch of nice people, but because they've been filled with the power of the Holy Spirit, which enabled them to live differently, think differently, behave differently in God's power and not in my preaching has become so fiery, I've set the fire alarm off. I wish. Anyway, as I was saying before the fire alarm went off, uh, being filled with the power of the Holy Spirit enabled them to live in a different form of power that wasn't their own power and strength and relying on their own righteousness, which would never be good enough, but on the righteousness of Jesus. So that when God the Father looks at us, he doesn't see the broken, sinful mess that we are, but sees the purity and holiness and righteousness of his son, Jesus, who died in our place on the cross. And when we're filled with the Holy Spirit, we are able to do what we would never be able to do in our own strength. And the Bible tells us that. Jesus said we, we'd be able to do what he did and, he, and to an extent even greater. Uh, I'd like to be able to do what he, what he did before I could even do even, even greater. That's another story. But it's by the grace of God that we're saved. That's what Romans 3, 24 you know, if 3.23 is we all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, Romans 3.24 is, and we are justified freely by his grace. That is not just good news. As I said, that is great news. So being filled with the Holy Spirit means that we can have access to the power of God that is within us to help us to say no to sin and yes to choosing to live the right way or righteousness. Now that is, as I say, not just good news, that is great news. That is ecstatic news. That is news to get excited about. That is news to tell people about. You know, you may not be an evangelist, but we can all share good news when we get it. And many of us, we might struggle to reach people, I think we do, but we would have no problem telling people about having a good meal or having gone somewhere nice on holiday or seen a good film. We'll happily talk about things that we get excited about. And maybe the reason why we don't talk about Jesus is because we're not excited. Well, I think when we begin to grasp how great the good news is, we should be excited. And if you're not, I'm not having a go at you because I've been there. I understand you. I understand this. If you're not, then maybe we need to get back to the Saviour, the person who is the good news, get close to him, have another fresh encounter, and I mean a real encounter with Jesus, so that we get excited again and we can't wait to tell people about it. That is the good news. And we need to hold on to that good news and not forget it, because the message of the Sermon on the Mount gets even harder from here. So it's been getting progressively more difficult, uh, the teachings of Jesus. This is why many people left. They said, your teachings are too hard. We can't follow them. Well, the bad news, if you want, it's going to get even more difficult as we progress through the rest of the Sermon on the Mount. But never lose sight of the good news. It was never about you being able to meet those standards. You can't. I can't. But Jesus can. He did and he can. And he does it on our behalf. But it doesn't mean to say we shouldn't try. As his disciples, it's important that we understand this and try and live to a better standard so that when we go out, we can show the world hope. Not show the world that we're perfect. We're not. I am certainly not perfect. Far, far from being perfect. Uh, 
we, you know, we mess up, we get things wrong, we sin. Whether you want to admit it or not, even after becoming Christians, we sin. And if you don't think you've sin, you sin, you've already guilty of sin because you've got pride. <laughs> so we all sin. So it's not about that. It's not about being perfect, but it's about having Jesus in our lives. And even when we fail, having the wonderful truth that we can come back again to the cross and repent and say, I'm sorry. And know that the blood of Jesus covers all our sins. That's the great news. So let's let's keep on keeping on. Let's keep on trying to live to that standard, knowing that we'll never be perfect. We'll never totally get it right. Only Jesus did. But one day we will become perfect when Jesus returns for us. The Bible tells us that. That's even more good news. And until then, you will get it wrong. You'll live this dichotomy of a life where you're good, not do, just good one day and bad the next, but sometimes good and bad on the same day, sometimes good and bad on the same minute, you know. <laughs> uh, and it's, it's a dilemma we're going to live with for the rest of our lives. But don't be discouraged. Be encouraged. That's normal. I'm not trying to make light of wrong behaviour or sin. I want to encourage you. It's normal sometimes to have doubts and maybe to fail and to fall. But get back up. Don't live in sin. Don't live in, in suffering and disappointment and failure. If it's a situation that you can't physically get out of, I get that. But we can still trust in Jesus, our Saviour. And that's good news. So as it gets tougher to follow him, we've got to remember we've got the Holy Spirit in us to make it possible. So don't just hang on in there. Be encouraged and look forward to next week. And can I encourage you, please, watch that message from Francis Chan. Because if you want to get a better understanding of my heart for discipleship and why the church needs to change, drastically needs to change and go back to what Jesus called us to do, then I can't put it any better than Francis Chan does in that message. So take care. God bless and see you again soon. Bye.